Joe Rogan's story starts off with the misfortune of being raised without a dad. He only knew his father, who goes by the same namesake, Joseph Rogan, a cop in New Jersey, for the first few years of his life. After that, he only had his busy mother to take care of him, lacking the level of care and nurturing children usually receive, which he says impacted his relationships later down the line. Whereas yeah. someone who grows up in a big household filled with people and the family was always there and everyone was there, you might take people for granted a little bit, you know, whereas for me, uh, camaraderie and closeness and all that, that means a lot to me. Man. My parents, my, you know, my mom worked, my stepdad was a really good guy, but no one was ever around. You know, there's just, there was no, and when they were done working, everybody was tired. You know, I was a latchkey kid, you know. When, you, when I was like seven years old, I lived in San Francisco. I would go out and do a magic show on Fisherman's Wharf by myself. Just wander around the city. Just, they would open the door, you just leave. Seven. According to Rogan, he had conflicted memories of his father. On one hand, he idolized him like a lot of kids do at that age, and he says his dad was partially responsible for cultivating his interest in fighting. Well, at the time, I thought that my father was like a hero. You know, he was my dad. I think every kid thinks like that about his dad. His dad is like, your dad's your protector. Your dad is like the coolest guy in the world. That's so what you like. like. Yeah. yeah, everybody wants to be like their dad. My dad got me alone and he said, tell me what happened. And I told him, you know, we got in a fight, we were arguing, we were King Kong and Godzilla, and uh, I punched him in the face. And he goes, did you cry? I go, no. He goes, good, don't ever cry. And I remember that, like, whoa, okay. And I remember thinking, all right, I'm just gonna start punching people. <laughs> because like, obviously my dad thinks it's a good idea if I go running around punching people as long as I don't cry. The flip side is that, to be the kind of person to take no issue with his son fighting, Joe Sr. was allegedly an extremely violent man himself. In old episodes of JRE, Joe claimed to have witnessed instances of violence from his father, though he says they were never targeted at him. My real father was crazy. He was like a psychotic person. He was he beat the fuck out of my mother. Like he would be the type to come he home like, the what the out of my cousin. Dinner? Really? Yeah, yeah, he beat my cousin up. He picked my cousin up by his hair, dude. My dad picked him up by his fucking hair. I'll wow. never forget. Threw him in. He was a big guy. Big, scary, crazy cop from New Jersey. Wow. Yeah, so that was all my sh from when I was like real young. I got to see, I got to see worst case scenario, someone who just can't keep it together, smacks women, uh -huh. beats the shit out of kids. Apparently this behavior extended outside of the household and Joseph would have his son spectate his brawls with random people. I would watch him beat guys up at this bar. He owned a bar and I was five and I got to hang out at the bar <laughs> when I was five. When I was five, I would sit there and I would, I would put money in the jukebox. They would let me put money in the jukebox and every now and then I'd watch him beat the f out of somebody. That is so bad. <laughs> I was five. Those are all my memories of my oh father. My he also wanted Joe to get into karate himself once he was older, but those desires wouldn't come to fruition, as Rogan's parents divorced when he was five years old. From that point on, his father would never be in his life again. However, Joe would continue to have somewhat of a turbulent childhood, moving from New Jersey to San Francisco, then to Florida, and after that to Boston, which made it difficult for him to put down any roots. When his stepfather entered the picture, who was the exact opposite of Joe's biological father, he provided quite a different influence on young Rogan. So I go from that to this other dude who's like super nice and he smokes pot and he's really smart. He's a mathematical genius. He's a yeah. computer programmer and he decides that computer program is not artistically satisfying so he wants to go to school and he takes my mom and he marries her and we move across the country and all of a sudden I have this new dad and he's like this hippie guy. So I went from living around these Italian New Jersey psychopaths yeah. to all of a sudden I'm in San Francisco and it's all like peace and love. It's the 70s, <laughs> man. Thankfully, the family would end up staying in Boston. This gave Joe some stability going into adolescence, which tends to be a very chaotic period in people's lives. And he was no exception. As a teenager, he started encountering hurdles related to his identity and what he was going to do with his life. For one, he was getting bullied in high school and just generally felt like a loser. All most feelings of l lack of worth and self-worth come from that feeling as you're developing, as you're growing up. Yeah. <clears throat> you feel like you're not loved or you're not appreciated or you're, you're, you're criticized too much. You feel like you're a loser. It really be psych psychologically, it can be very hard to shake. Yeah, it's... Dude, yeah. I was scared of this one kid. Really? Oh, so bad. This one kid, um, one of the reasons why I got into wrestling, this kid, uh, like, we had this confrontation in a locker room mm -hmm. and I didn't think we were gonna fight like I was just totally bluffing I don't know what I said or what he said I don't remember but I do remember him getting me in a headlock mm. throwing me on the ground and then leaning like he was gonna punch me in the face but deciding not to he was also increasingly realizing that he wasn't cut out for a normal job and an ordinary life 
the things that I got interested in, martial arts and then and then comedy, if I hadn't gotten interested in those things, I would have been fucked because I was just too independent for normal jobs. I was too independent for school. I just didn't want to listen to people. I was too feral. I just didn't want to didn't want to sit still. I, if I was with the wrong parents, especially today, I most certainly would have been medicated. He didn't want to feel like a failure anymore, but knew he couldn't excel at life in the typical ways. So he started trying to find a different area to succeed in. This first manifested as an interest in comic books because, surprisingly enough, Joe wanted to be a comic book artist. This hobby also served as an outlet for him to get away from all the rougher aspects of his life. For me, early on, it was drawing. It was uh, illustrations. It was uh, comic books. I wanted to be a comic book illustrator. And then it went from uh, comic book drawing and illustrations to um, martial arts. So, But it was uh, just another thing that I was very, very passionate about. And that was my vehicle out of my dilemma. That was my vehicle out of my, my own anxiety and trauma and my own issues and insecurities. His ambitions eventually transformed into a penchant for martial arts, spurred on specifically by his experience of almost being punched in the face and no longer wanting to be the powerless one in any given confrontation. I don't want to see that guy that threw me on the ground and could have punched me in the face. It was almost like more humiliating. That he, he didn't? He could have punched me in the face, but he didn't. But that bullying, and that guy doing that to me, that fear of like being um, just helpless mm -hmm. made me get into martial arts. One of the biggest decisions of my whole life is getting involved in martial arts. I just didn't want that feeling anymore. Like I, if someone gives me a hard time, mm -hmm. I want to be the one who can decide whether or not this gets violent or who gets hurt. I don't want to leave that into some stranger's hands who might be a fucking psychopath. Martial arts turned out to be exactly what he needed. At age 14, he began practicing karate, and a year later, he started taekwondo. By age 15, he was sold on it and it became his whole life. Honing his skills as a fighter changed his perspective on his own capabilities. I was terrified of being a loser. Martial arts gave me not just confidence, but also a different perspective on myself and what I was capable of. I knew that I could do something I was terrified of, and that was really difficult and that I could excel at it. It was a big deal for me. It was the first thing that ever gave me hope that I wasn't going to be a loser, so I really, really gravitated toward it. It wasn't just a casual hobby for him either. Four years into Taekwondo, Rogan won the US Championship Taekwondo Tournament at the age of 19 as a lightweight. That was a Taekwondo Tournament. I was 19 then. Oh. And that was you? Yeah, with that, the was walk -off? that was me with the walk-off. <laughs> You have to walk away and like make it look like it's no big deal. That right. was how my thought process was. Mm -hmm. Don't get excited. Make it look like this is what I'm going to do to everybody. Just relax. Just walk off and, and have everybody so nervous that you don't even care. He also became a Massachusetts full contact state champion for four consecutive years. These accomplishments allowed him to start building momentum in his life when he otherwise didn't have much going for him. I, I didn't know I wasn't a loser until I started winning, until I started doing martial arts. Martial arts taught me that like I could get better at stuff. I wasn't really a loser. I just was someone who was like in a fucked up situation. So I went from being someone who was incredibly insecure and basically a failure to someone who was really successful at this one thing that was very dangerous that other people were scared of. And that gave me immense confidence. He started teaching Taekwondo at 17, given his proficiency with it, and even got into amateur boxing and kickboxing scenes to see what they were about, doubting that Taekwondo was truly the end-all be-all of combat sports. As such, he participated in a few professional fights, knowing that he wanted to pursue this as his career path. In fact, according to him, it seems like there was never any other option. Back when he was 16, his stepdad had arranged a gig working construction, and while there, it only solidified in his mind that a menial job was the last thing he wanted. Fighting, meanwhile, felt like a promising alternative to a monotonous life. But, just when he felt like he was finally getting somewhere, reality would catch up to Joe. His record would forever remain at 2-1, because he retired from competition at only 21 years of age. This was because, as cool as martial arts look, there are some tough truths about fighting professionally, such as how difficult it is to compete, as well as the real risk of getting seriously injured, with the prospect of head trauma being particularly worrisome. Apparently, Rogan's success with Taekwondo gave him a distorted view of what he could accomplish in the ring. The reality did not match up with his expectations, which would be a shock to anyone's ego. More importantly than that, he started regularly getting headaches from training, and worried about his health as a result, with the possibility of being kicked in the head looming over him. This career path wasn't turning out how Rogan had hoped, and as such, he was plunged back into the fear that he had experienced as a high schooler, not knowing what to do for work, feeling directionless. Everybody was scared. That was really at the bottom line of it. We're all young 
young men, and we're on our way to becoming adults, and no one knows what the f*** they're gonna do. And we have a few friends that have graduated high school, and they're losers now, and like, sh that might be me. Like, that was the big cloud that was always hanging over everybody's head. What are you doing after high school? What are you doing after high school? And it was like this impending date of doom that was coming up. So everybody was scared all the time. Yeah. And everybody wanted to be, they wanted to be a man. Everybody, they wanted to prove themselves. They wanted to be something special, and no one felt special. He had never taken his SATs because he didn't see himself ever returning to school, but the pressure of being viewed as a failure by those around him finally got to him. And he subsequently attended a community college and then the University of Massachusetts. But I got so tired of feeling like a f***ing loser. Like when I tell people I was taking, I would always say I was taking a year off, taking a year off. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it really, I just had no direction. All I was doing was like doing martial arts and competing. And I just was so terrified of what the, f the future lead. And so I went to UMass for like three years, but not like three full years. It was like there was still a lot of uh, credits to, to be acquired if I was mm -hmm. going to graduate. And I just was wasting my time. I was barely paying attention. I was completely half-assing whatever project we had. And then I was realizing like, what am I, why am I wasting my time? But try as he might, academics simply weren't his thing. He found the whole endeavor pointless because he wasn't giving it his all and was spurred on to drop out by various experiences. One of them being a memorable interaction with a science teacher. I had a conversation with um, a science teacher. He was talking about uh, Lake Erie being a dead lake. And I said, listen, man, they had a documentary on PBS last night about Lake Erie making a resurgence. And these scientists have figured out these new ways to minimize water pollution and all this shit. And like other kids are looking at me like, what the fuck? And he said, in interrupting a class, you showed yourself to be more articulate and more intelligent than you ever showed ever in the entire semester. Mm -hmm. So you're totally half-assing everything you do. Uh -huh. Like your writing, everything, paper you turn in, every test you do, every time I call upon you for a question, totally half to half ass that. But when you wanted to correct me on something, all of a sudden you knew all the words, you knew how to form the sentence correctly, you knew how to say it with the right impact. It's mm -hmm. like, you just, you just, your focus is off. Mm -hmm. I was like, God damn, that dude's on the money. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I'm like, yeah, so I'm not stupid, right? I just can't, I can't listen. <laughs> but what was next for Joe if not finishing university? Well, he decided to bet everything on his next pivot to the last career path he would expect for a roided up boxer, stand-up comedy. Comics, even ones who do lowbrow humor, tend to be more cerebral than physical. But Joe apparently had enough of that aspect, perhaps cultivated by his stepfather, to make it work for himself. Though, that's not to say it was smooth sailing from the get-go. What drew him to comedy in the first place wasn't necessarily his own interest, even. It was those around him that encouraged Rogan to try it, because he was always the guy that brought the mood up before fights. I got talked into doing stand-up by my friends from martial arts. Well, you must have been funny. Well, I was only funny because it was like gallows humor. We would go to compete, or we would be about to spar, and I would be the guy who would make everybody laugh. Because everybody was so nervous, because it was scary. You beat the shit out of each other, you know? He did his first stand-up routine shortly after turning 21 and even within several months of preparation, he was caught off guard by how terrified he was to perform, especially as someone who had competed in combat sports. But the second most nervous was before I did stand-up for the first time. I was in my pants, man. I was really fucking nervous. I just didn't have a background in performing. And right before I was going up there, I was thinking all the times that I, I fought and I should be comfortable doing this. Right. But I was fucking sh** in my pants. Even more embarrassing for him were the jokes themselves. What did you do? Observe? No, I just I just told some terrible jokes. Terrible jokes. Like literally set up punchline? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were awful. The stuff that I'd written, you know, just weird did stuff. Did you write them down? To, yeah, yeah, yeah. I even had a piece of paper that I brought with me on stage because I was terrified I was going to forget. A lot of guys in Bro. the beginning, you knew you were a pro when you could put that paper away. Um, I had one joke that I remember. All right, about, there you This go. is my impression of a good-looking girl getting pulled over by a cop. Do you realize how fast we're going? No. Do you like my tits? Yes, I do. Here's a warning. Like, it was that bad. <laughs> But the nerve-wracking nature of it wasn't enough to deter Rogan from pursuing stand-up, because he really enjoyed it. However, as he got his bearings, he still needed a way to pay the bills. So he took odd jobs, delivering newspapers, driving limousines, and working as an assistant to a private investigator. Any kind of job he could get his hands on just so he could keep working on material. During this time, he met various up-and-coming comics from Boston like Bill Burr and Louis C.K., becoming embedded in what, at the time, was a thriving culture of comedians trying to make their way in the world. Some would succeed within the greater Boston area and make a living doing sets at local venues. Others, meanwhile, would go on to the big leagues to be international stars, with TV deals and the likes. Seeing the potential for upward mobility outside of education, Joe pursued comedy as much as possible. A couple years later, in 1990, he was officially doing comedy full-time. His old sets show a very different Joe from the one we know now. Put your hands together for Mr. Joe Rogan! Give me a hand! Fun is here, folks! 
Let's just want to touch them. And <laughs> breasts to a guy are like a light bulb to a moth, aren't they? Because of his raunchy style of humor, he was hired to perform in venues like bachelor parties and strip clubs. He even caught the attention of a talent manager, Jeff Sussman, and ended up moving to New York City to further bolster his career. Four years later, in 94, Rogan decided to move to LA to get in on show business. He landed his first role on TV in the MTV show, Half Hour Comedy Hour. What's up? What's going on, huh? You doing all right? Yeah. Well, it's going pretty cool right now, but uh, I gotta stop dating bimbos. It's like the biggest problem I have in my life right now. So I date too many bimbos. The bimbos are good to date every now and then because they're low maintenance, right? <laughs> With his success, he was seen as a promising talent in the industry and started being offered a myriad of opportunities. After he turned down an exclusive contract, as well as an offer to do a game show, Sussman, being his manager, sent recordings of Joe's performance to a handful of networks. This started a bidding war, which Disney eventually won, securing a deal with Rogan. During all of this, Joe stepped out of the world of pure comedy to dip his toes into acting for the first time on the Fox sitcom Hardball. Despite his inexperience as an actor, the president of Walt Disney Television took a liking to him during the casting process process because of an offhand remark he made about acting. If you can lie, you can act. And if you can lie to crazy girlfriends, you can act under pressure. However, the show suffered due to the hiring of a bad producer who meddled with the script, apparently ruining it in the process. According to Joe, it was a great show on paper until a horrible executive producer with a big ego was hired by Fox to run the show and he rewrote it. Not exactly a great entrance into the world of acting, but his wide appeal kept his career chugging along. He started performing at the Comedy Store in Hollywood, where he became a paid regular, and would continue to perform there for the next 13 years. In 1995, Joe got another shot at a sitcom role with News Radio, which luckily turned out to be a far more acclaimed show. He fittingly starred as Joe Gorelli, the handyman at the show's fictional news radio station. And if you know anything about news radio, you'll know he worked alongside a Turkey Tom Channel favorite, Andy Dick. You know, you gotta be careful though. Sometimes they mess up and put a real can of nuts in with the joke can. No. Really? really? <laughs> it happens, man. You gotta double check. I always check myself. Yeah. And, with anyone who crosses paths with Andy Dick, no matter how remotely, it would end up giving Rogan serious grief. You see, Rogan had become close friends with fellow cast member Phil Hartman while working on the show, who confided in him about problems in his marriage to his wife Bryn. Rogan claims he attempted to persuade Hartman to divorce his wife multiple times. This situation came to a tragic end when Bryn, a recovering drug addict, started using co- again, which fellow actor John Lovitz blamed on Andy Dick. Bryn would end up murdering Phil in 1998 while intoxicated with c and alcohol. Hartman's death impacted Rogan to such an extent that, though he was regularly doing stand-up when it happened, he simply couldn't perform and had to cancel a week's worth of shows. News radio would be canceled in 1999, and this left Joe in a position to reconsider his life direction. Although he was thankful for the gig as an actor, Rogan was burnt out from doing the same shtick week after week and year after year. He was only motivated by that paycheck. Money which allowed him to do stand-up on the side as his true passion. Joe needed to secure another job that would permit him to continue on in the same way with his other passions. Luckily, in 1999, Rogan negotiated a deal for three comedy albums with Warner Bros. Records. Also in the works were plans to feature in his own sitcom on Fox called The Joe Rogan Show, which was to feature Rogan as a second-string sportscaster who lands a spot as the token male on a View-style women's show. But this never came to fruition. As his opportunities for gigs on TV dried up, there was a new scene in entertainment that was just beginning to blossom, that coincidentally dovetailed with his first love martial arts. That new scene was the Ultimate Fighting Championship, or UFC. Initially intended to be a single event when it launched in 1993, the UFC was giving way to the creation of an entirely new sport, though no one knew it at the time. The premise of it, which continues on to this day, was a fighting tournament that pitted every martial arts style against each other, with as minimal rules as possible, in an attempt to end any speculation about which techniques were superior to actual combats, making it an alluring sport for martial arts enthusiasts like Joe Rogan. Joe had been watching the development of the UFC since the early 90s, and like most other viewers at the time, became fascinated with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, as he watched a slender-looking Hoist Gracie take down the kind of hulking muscular guys he would see on WWE, not by overpowering them with punches, but by using BJJ techniques to win against them on the ground. It was the performance at UFC 2 that first caught Rogan's eye, and from then on, he was hooked. In 1996, Rogan began training in Jiu-Jitsu, rekindling his love for martial arts, which he had set aside for the most 
part ever since he became a comic. With the assistance of Sussman, who knew the organizer of the UFC, Rogan scored a gig as a post-fight interviewer, getting the chance to vicariously experience these other fighters' wins and losses. He made his first appearance on the UFC in February of 1997, at UFC 12. Mark, we can get a couple words to you. Congratulations. Unbelievable, impressive performance. Thank you. However, for the time being, his involvement would only be short-lived, since he resigned after just two years. Rogan just wanted to drink and enjoy the fights as a fan, for the pure love of the sport, rather than turning it into a job, especially when the pay wasn't anything compared to his comedy earnings. On top of that, it was actually costing him money to do the gig. In the early days of less rules and regulations, where the fights were as close to no-holds-barred as they ever were, the UFC was seen as so barbaric that it was banned in 36 states. So, it can only be hosted in, well, the fun states, like Alabama. As such, Rogan was regularly paying travel expenses to fly out to fights, which the organization couldn't cover the cost of since they weren't mainstream yet. Joe Rogan's mind changed on this matter in 2001, after being offered free tickets to each event for him and all his friends by the new UFC president, Dana White. Rogan would end up commentating on 15 different matches for free before finally agreeing to a proper salary, persisting as a UFC commentator to this day, work he's received numerous awards for. Of course, the job is fraught with entertaining and chaotic moments, which seem to be Joe's bread and butter. I'm here with the winner, Derek Lewis. Derek, why'd you take your pants off? My balls was hot. I understand. Oh, wow, look at all the ice all over yeah, there. Oh, we got a problem. Yep, Someone nope. spilled the ice in the octagon. That's a big problem. That's a lot of ice. He's I'm going to take some ice time. Right now. I'll take a second. Our guys are working it. This is a disaster. Go, go, go. Oh, no, this is good. Look at that. They knocked the bucket over. This is the three stooges. What are you freaks doing? You it's still it. too much. Get the back. Get back in there. You're not done. There's <laughs> ice all over the floor. What are these guys? They ran out. I'm done. No, we got it. There's ice everywhere. They're those corner men, someone needs to kick their ass. Fight. His own interview style was as unchained as the fights themselves, as he doesn't hesitate to talk to guys whose mental state is fraught due to having been knocked unconscious mere minutes ago, and he has no problem with being brutally honest with them. For example, when Gray Maynard knocked himself out after slamming his opponent to the ground, Joe disputed him in the octagon about who won the fight. In the takedown, right after the takedown, he tapped, but you were unconscious. You knocked yourself out in the takedown. Look at, look at the replay, you're cold, totally unconscious. Take a look at this. Look at the replay, bro. Rogan also got real with an emotional Daniel Cormier, who was just knocked out and lost his fight. I don't think it's a good idea to interview fighters after they've been knocked out, but I really wanted to give you a chance to express yourself. I know this was an incredible moment for you. It was very emotional. What, what can you say at all about this and the rivalry between you and John? I don't know, man. I guess if you win both fights, there is no rivalry, so I, I don't know. Thank you for everything, Daniel. During this time, he was also still working on a stand-up. He recorded his first comedy album in 1999, and it was released in August 2000. A single produced by Warner called Voodoo Poo Nanny was released around the same time as well. Safe to say, its content was truly astounding, light years ahead of its time. Rogan had basically made WAP 20 years before Cardi B got to it. Voodoo. She got nothing on that Rogan swag. In 2001, with the internet on its way to becoming a proper force to be reckoned with in entertainment, Joe began writing blog posts on his website, JoeRogan.net, to help develop material for his routines. That same year, his career in entertainment would take another sharp turn when he accepted an offer from NBC to host Fear Factor. Fear Factor was a game show where contestants would compete for prize money by pulling off terrifying and disgusting stunts. Because of this, Rogan was initially hesitant to host it, objecting to the heinous nature of these challenges. He he treated the prospect of hosting Fear Factor like a joke, thinking it would get cancelled immediately for being too egregious. But that just goes to show how little he knew about the nature of American media in the early 2000s. He was under the impression that the only thing he would get out of this endeavor was material for his stand-up routines, even attending meetings for Fear Factor while high. But, ironically, his nonchalant attitude and talks for the show ended up actually getting him the role. While other contenders tried to be intimidating, he was just a laid-back guy, and despite his pessimistic predictions, Fear Factor ended up being a huge hit. It was a preposterous show, like from the jump, and I always thought it was going to be canceled, and it was a giant hit. It was a giant hit. Huge show. And they like, like immediately, it was a hit. I was like, this is so stupid. The show is so stupid. <laughs> This, of course, made Joe more recognizable on a nationwide scale, especially since the show went on for six seasons, with Rogan ending up doing almost 150 episodes of this insanity. Fear Factor led to further television opportunities, and Rogan became the host of The Man Show on Comedy Central in 2003, which was an extremely raunchy series 
about everything manly that tested the limits of what could be shown on the air. This half-hour comedy show focuses on things men enjoy. Beer, women, and well, come on, how much more do you really need? This show features dancing women who often wear semi-revealing outfits, and each episode ends with footage of women jumping on trampolines. Much like Fear Factor, some of the younger viewers may be surprised this was ever allowed on network television, but part of the humor was how absurdly stereotypically it portrayed masculine interests. You'll never believe who launched it, though. Adam Carolla and Jimmy Kimmel. Yes, that same Jimmy Kimmel, who today is all concerned with geopolitical issues on his talk show, was doing bits like, uh, well, you can see it for yourself. Women are voting. Seems like almost every year now, all thanks to the women's suffrage movement. Led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, pioneers in the field of bitching, moaning, and complaining. Many today shy away from this kind of humor and plug their ears at it, but the bottom line is that this was routine in the early 2000s. And, uh, yeah, people were pretty mad when they discovered this show again. Rogan and his co-host, Doug Stanhope, seemed to have a good time doing their bits, as crazy as they were. What do you think is the biggest difference between men of your generation and the men of today? The men of yesterday were a little bit more circumspect about their behavior and their language. I'm circumspect and I'm not even Jewish. Try it, champ. Uh, you're gonna beat a girl. You're gonna fight like a girl. However, a year into the show, Joe and Doug started having conflicts with Comedy Central over the man show's content. Apparently, it was too much even for them. Rogan recalled, I was a little misled. I was told, show nudity and we'll blur it out. Swear and we'll bleep it out. This has not been the case. And despite Joe entering talks to host his own radio show, his busy schedule prevented it from happening. In 2005, the actor Wesley Snipes of Blade fame would invite Joe Rogan to step into the octagon with him for a real fight. With his martial arts background and growing experience, expertise in jiu-jitsu ever since he got interested in the UFC, Rogan took the proposition seriously and trained for five months to get ready. But this spectacle never came to be because Snipes backed out of the fight. It wasn't necessarily that he lost his nerve though. In fact, the decision had been made for him by the IRS. The Internal Revenue Service had launched an investigation against him for alleged tax evasion, which in 2008, he would be sentenced to three years in prison for, and ordered to pay an astounding $5 million in fines. Joe speculated that the actor proposed a fight to turn a quick profit that could help with his debts. If the fight did actually happen, Joe said that he would have respected Snipes' fighting chops, but was confident that he could dominate him with his jiu-jitsu know-how, since he had been training in the martial art for 10 years by that point, and had gotten his brown belt, which is no easy task, since each belt in BJJ takes several years to get on average. Uh, you know, um, he was in a bad situation where he owed taxes, and the, the government, they put him in jail. You know, he got put in jail for tax evasion. I think he had bad advisors, and sometimes advisors would tell you, like, there's a law, and you don't have to follow that law, because it was, and um, I think he's great, and he's a legit martial artist. It wouldn't have been easy. But I also knew that he didn't have any jiu-jitsu training. And I was like, I know how to kickbox. I know I fought. I fought a lot of Taekwondo tournaments. I fought some kickboxing matches. I'm like, I know how to strike. If he doesn't know any jujitsu at the time, I was a brown belt. I was like, good luck. I'm going to grab you. It's what the diff fuck are you going to do if I grab you? Like, it's, I don't think people understand how helpless you are yeah. if you're not trained in jujitsu or even if you're a blue belt. It was around the same time that Rogan was feeling a bit bored from working on these scripted and mind-numbing TV shows, so he decided to continue growing his online presence, seeing the potential of the internet. He paid people to film him around the clock while he was on tour with his fellow comics, and turned the footage into content for his website, in a series called The Joe Show. Accordingly, in 2005, Rogan filmed his second comedy special, which would be released in 2007. He would later unexpectedly host Fear Factor one last time for a seventh season, but the 2011 revival of the show came to an end after one particular disgusting stunt was pulled, which I can't describe here for monetization reasons. Let's just say it involved chugging 12 ounces of a liquid known as donkey juice. We did 148 episodes, and then we did another, I think we did six, or seven, but only six aired, because one of them was the one when they had a drink. No, she- Yeah. What are uh, you talking about? A jug of- Who made it? A uh, donkey. They're like from Joe Rogan. Donkey, yeah, my own- <laughs> 
<laughs> took me a it year took you. <laughs> to fill up everyone's stein. Are you fucking kidding me? The episode wasn't actually released at the time, but information about it leaked and got into the hands of outlets like TMZ, who had a field day with it. As for Joe, he only participated in the reboot to chase that bag, although it was for the sake of his family. In his words, I didn't have as much money back then, and also, it was a lot more money than what I got for it the first time. It was a big deal, but I immediately regretted it. What was good about Fear Factor is that it finally made him financially free. No longer would he have to bounce between gigs in acting, comedy, and fighting just to stay afloat. Instead, he could do whatever he was interested in. It's a prospect most people only get to dream of, but he had achieved it before hitting 40. On his blog, he would write a post about his thoughts on the show coming to a close, highlighting how stand-up continued to be his true passion in life. Fear Factor has reached its end, and I couldn't be happier or more excited. My first love has always been stand-up comedy, and that's all I'm going to work on now. I never set out to act in sitcoms or host a game show, it's just sort of something that happened. They offered me jobs, and I took them. I've enjoyed it for the most part, but never as much as I enjoy stand-up. The real problem is that I've spread my focus out into all of these other things. My stand-up is what has suffered, and that's the thing that's the most important to me. I rode Fear Factor into the beach, and now that it's done, I'm looking forward to really concentrating on my comedy from here on out. I've got a couple other projects cooking, but they're all related to my actual interests as opposed to just my interest in making money. Don't get me wrong, Fear Factor was a great gig, and I certainly benefited from it a great deal. But for the most part, it was just a job. It was a great job, but still just a job. Stand up, on the other hand, has never felt like a job to me. It's always been this fascinating, ever-growing and expanding, living art form that somehow I'm a part of. To do it, you have to constantly focus on it and constantly work at it. It's literally an expression of life. The more you think about life and explore your curiosities, the more it grows. The rewards from it are so much sweeter than any aspect of show business, and they're immediate. I f***ing love it. And when it all comes together, there's really nothing more fun. It's really like a living thing. A big, live collection of ideas that, when put together properly and performed with enthusiasm, actually makes people feel better. And, like a living thing, you have to nurture it and feed it in order for it to grow. The more I focus on it, the more I'm aware of how much there is to it. Rogan would post somewhat regularly to his blog during 2006, and there's a couple intriguing tidbits from that time period. Apparently, he got in a spat with a random person online who sent him insulting emails. Rather than ignore the guy, he decided to engage him, which was a revealing moment as far as showing what Joe's character is like. He didn't see himself as a celebrity, he saw himself as just another guy. The post reads, The other day I was sitting around making phone calls and answering emails when I came across an email from a kid on MySpace that has emailed me in the past being a dick. The email said, I hate you, you're not funny. I decided to engage him in a childish war of insults and then I posted it all on my blog. Now, I posted it because I thought some people would find it amusing, but it wound up being posted on several different sites on the net and stirring up quite a little bit of controversy. I know a lot of people have ideas about how people in the public eye are supposed to respond to people that are not, but the way I look at it is this. I'm just a person, and when another person acts like an asshole to me, I reserve the right to be an asshole back. I'm not defending my actions, but I am explaining how I think about it, or at least thought about it at the time. People say, you're the asshole picking on some 20-year-old college student, to which I say, absolutely. That's what I was going for. Other blog posts detail detailed as unorthodox adventures, and were probably intended to be incorporated into his stand-up routines. In one, he describes his thought process while high in an airport, wondering how alluring an old lady was when she was in her prime. And in another, talks about the time he went to a viewing for an adult movie, where the director treated it like the premiere of a film. He gets up and he thanks everybody for coming, and then he talks about the movie like it was some really difficult accomplishment, and how so many people told him it couldn't be done. But, back in 2005, Rogan had used his blog as a platform for something a little more serious. He accused comedian Carlos Mencia of stealing jokes, which is unfortunately quite a common occurrence in stand-up to this day. Joe had leveled this accusation at Mencia as early as 1993, but it wasn't until 2007 that an altercation would happen between the two. Rogan confronted Mencia on stage at the Comedy Store in Hollywood, and a friend of his, Brian Redban, who would later help him with his podcast, filmed the argument that followed. It was edited into a video which Rogan posted online. The crowd cheered Joe on as he and Mencia yelled and swore at each other, and the video also features examples of Mencia telling similar jokes as other comedians. Here's this new thing, I don't know if you guys heard this. He wants to build a new wall all down the California-Mexico border. Like a 12-foot high brick wall, it's like three feet deep. So no Mexicans get in. But I'm like, dude, Arnold, um, who do you think is going to build that wall? Um, I propose that we kick all the illegal aliens out of this country. Then we build a super fence so they can't get back in. And I went, um, who's gonna build it? 
Rogan also had the backing of George Lopez, Bob Levy, Bobby Lee, Ari Shafir, and more in this controversial endeavor, who would, according to Joe, go on to thank him for sticking his neck out on their behalf. Unfortunately, the same talent agency that managed Rogan worked for Mencia as well. They ended up giving Joe an ultimatum, either apologize to Carlos or find another agency to work with. You can probably guess how that turned out. Really clear, you tell me if this is what you're saying. You're saying you want me to apologize or you can't work with me anymore. Well, we're done. You know, there's no apology, and we're never going to work together. The reason they did this was that Mencia was a far more valuable asset to the agency because of how much more revenue he pulled in than Rogan. They did not particularly care if that money was being made off of other people's stolen ideas. The Comedy Store also banned Rogan from the premises. Despite the club having been his go-to venue for so long, they sided with Mencia because he was the more popular comedian. Doing the right thing doesn't always go how you want it to, but that's life. Rogan took the blow gracefully and migrated to a different comedy club in Hollywood. The internet, on the other hand, had a much different response than the industry. The video went viral and Mencia's reputation was irreversibly tarnished with the label of joke thief. While reflecting on the incident much later on, Joe said he regretted that the situation had escalated to such a heated and negative conflict, but reaffirmed that he would do the same thing again on principle. I don't like trash and fellow comedians. I no. really don't. I genuinely, genuinely don't. No. W did that change after Mencia? You felt a little yeah, bad? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> really? I so. You yeah. felt bad During about it? During the moment of it. Um, uh, I realized how much negativity it creates. And I'm like, okay, uh, a good thing was done where, where people weren't in danger of having their uh, intellectual property taken by someone who's far more successful. Mm. But a, the weird thing was the anger. Like watching the anger, like, it's like you're throwing meat to a, 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 a group of piranhas. Carlos Mencia also revisited the controversy in recent years in an interview referenced by the New York Times. For the majority of comedians, Rogan was looked at, still is, as a kind of hero to the cause. It is ironic that a guy who is now saying you shouldn't cancel anybody at least started the building of his podcast by canceling me. This was a puzzling comment to say the least, as when Rogan gripes about cancel culture these days, it's in reference to politics or people losing their jobs. Exposing Carlos for stealing jokes has nothing to do with being taken to task for a political stance. Regardless, Carlos Mencia is evidently still coping and seething to this day. In April 2007, Joe's fourth comedy special called Shiny Happy Jihad premiered. As the name suggests, he broached controversial topics, but the album was still well received. At the time, if you only knew him from Fear Factor or the UFC, which he feared was the case for most people who knew his name, the last thing you'd expect is him interjecting into Middle Eastern affairs. But by this point, he was well on his way to becoming the guy we know now. The pothead dude who casually riffs on political and religious matters like he's Plato, and then goes right back into saying and doing ridiculous things. Back then, and to this day, Joe really just talks about whatever he's interested in, rather than what he thinks will make him the most popular. Rogan gives his views on suicide bombers, proposes solutions for peace in the Middle East, and debunks the story of Noah's Ark, among other topics. Rogan estimates that only 30% of those who know him have any idea that he's been a stand-up comedian for close to 20 years. 2009 would be another important year for Rogan, and maybe the biggest turning point in his life yet. For one, he married Jessica Ditzel, who he had a child with the previous year, and they've been together ever since, with three daughters. Himself not getting to properly experience having a father, it was all the more meaningful to him to have children he could be there for. One thing will happen, though, when you have kids, your bond with your kids, it's like, it's... I mean, I, I would assume that everyone's bond with their children is very tight because it's a, an unbelievable love connection that you have with children. It's, like it's true unconditional love. It's not just true unconditional. It's like they, they're a drug. Like they give you they give you love to the point where like my daughter, my, my youngest, was we were playing the other day in the pool. And there was a point in time we were just laughing about something together, just laughing. And I'm looking at her face and she's laughing. And I felt like I was on drugs. <laughs> I was like, yeah. the love that I have for these people is so it's so intense. It's 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 and it's also I didn't get that when I was a kid. The other event that took place in his life in 2009, one that you're probably more familiar with, was the official launch of his podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience. On that fateful Christmas Eve, the first ever episode of JRE was live streamed to the world. This ties into him just recently forming a family because his wife, getting pregnant, pushed him to move back out to Hollywood. He had successfully escaped the chaos of the celebrity world to live in Colorado for all of four months, but he was pulled right back in, and this spurred him on to create the podcast. If you remember correctly, by this point, Joe had already been involved in various content creation endeavors of his own with the help of the industry, which involved the assistance of Brian Redban, and the podcast was intended to be a continuation of the Paris collaboration. At the time, while there were a couple of other comedians with podcasts, it was really only limited to a small pool. The genre was truly in its infancy, and Joe being an early adopter is part of why it paid off for him so much. 
Having finished his career in acting for the most part, he would fully dedicate himself to JRE, while continuing to commentate for the UFC. When it started, there wasn't even the dynamic of bringing on guests like it's known for now, but Joe and Brian quickly realized they had to switch it up, since the podcast quickly got boring with just the two of them. Joe was able to pull comedians with enough of a following to get the ball rolling, and the rest was history. From the early 2010s and onwards, he got to show more of his fighting skills online in lieu of ever getting to have his own career in combat sports. And there's a bunch of videos of his insane kicks floating around on YouTube. <laughs> He also finally earned his black belt in jiu-jitsu, and got to pursue his interest by eventually starting an MMA podcast. One detour he took back into the world of television was in 2013, when Rogan hosted a show about investigating conspiracies called Joe Rogan Questions Everything. He got into topics from Bigfoot to UFOs, and was apparently baked out of his mind during the filming of the entire thing. People may forget about it now, but that was his brand for a good chunk of time. Conspiracies and that good old crud. By 2013, YouTube had also cemented itself as the premier destination for video content online, so the natural next step for Rogan was to migrate his podcast to the platform. I say it was natural in hindsight, but in reality, long-form content was a rare sight to behold on YouTube back then, so he was making a gamble as to whether his move would succeed or not. As you guys already know, it paid off big time, and every year that passed saw names with more and more clout coming on JRE. The average guest went from one of Joe's friends in comedy or MMA to the biggest personalities in entertainment, science, sports, and the list goes on. The question was, with so much content existing of these people, why would anyone be interested in them talking to Joe Rogan in particular? I think the answer lies in the fact that, as we've gone over, Joe has always been a bit of a wild guy. Unlike products that come out of Hollywood, which are subject to stringent filtering, his podcast is a reflection of him, so anything goes. Juxtapose that against the wall of scripts, lighting, and makeup celebrities are usually put behind before we ever get to interact with them, and the rawness of the podcast has a unique selling point. You can watch a couple of hours of your favorite person just existing exactly as they are in the real world, with no pretense or theatrics. In that regard, it's almost like the key to its success was that it capitalized on the dynamic we've now termed as parasocial relationships, way before that phrase was used widely. But nowadays, Joe is asking Jamie to pull things up, not Brian. So where did Brian Redband go? Well, Brian fumbled the opportunity to rise to the top with Rogan for the sake of Olive Garden. Seriously, he couldn't help himself from bringing up Olive Garden on the podcast at every possible opportunity, derailing conversations in the process. Are you dirty freaks? What's he so? Bye, love you. Olive Garden. They're oh. occupying everywhere. Occupy Olive Garden. You don't get much chance to cut loose and I, you really think of the Olive stories. Garden with your cigar. Because, uh, like, uh, I know so many girls that I talk to, their boyfriends are like, you know, fucking freaking out about Olive Garden. I went to the Olive Garden last night and had the best meal because I went to the Olive Garden. And guess what? I'm not sitting there disappointed. I'm like, no, this salad is awesome. These breadsticks are awesome. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is awesome. Well, if I'm being honest, the bigger problem was that he wasn't taking the podcast as seriously as Joe was. And this was best exemplified by one moment in particular, which you could say got unnecessarily heated, but mostly just goes to show how adamant Rogan was about creating a solid product. Brian would take these videos and make these hilarious little things out of them, little clips, and um, that's how we became friends. That's so interesting. I always wondered about that. I thought I always have a much more romantic story. You never. It was at the Olive. Go hey. By the way, I'm so <laughs> mad at people hating on restaurants that are like chain restaurants. Like, like I went to the Olive Garden last night and had the best meal and now ever. Another fucking impromptu Jesus Olive Garden Christ. reference. Here's, check He's this out. the worst segue there's this, guy there's ever. There's a sushi place in Studio City that has this famous <laughs> sushi thing called, I think it's called Sardo's or something. No, it's not Sardo's, but it's, it's uh, some other place, Katina or something, Katana. Okay. And they have this like all you can eat sushi thing for $26, right? <laughs> so, Does this have to do with what we were talking so, about? So. <laughs> We start eating it, and then we're like, this is disgusting. <coughs> no. Now, what's the point of the story, man? Is there a point? Yeah, because I went to the Olive Garden, and guess what? None of that sh ever happens at the Olive Garden. I'm not sitting there disappointed. I'm like, no, this salad is awesome. These breadsticks are awesome. This is awesome. This is so awesome. Point, this is awesome. Your point this awesome. of this whole sidetrack is that Olive Garden Olive is Olive Garden, food. all you can eat pasta, and everything cost me $40. That shitty ass okay. sushi, okay, 51 Brian, bucks. Who, who, who would want to listen to this? <laughs> Are you, do you realize that this is a podcast? Who the f 
would want to listen to you talk about how what a good you are product. So angry. I'm in the no, room, Brian, I'm, I'm being the room. honest with you. This is a this is a some this is a product. This podcast. Joe, why are you so uncomfortable right now? It's you, dude. You you're being you're, weird. You're this podcast. I could, I could feel listen you're very right angry right now. No, I'm not. You you've been awkward this entire podcast. Brian, you mean you are you happy with that story? How that all turned out? Not your reaction, but I was happy how my story no, no, was no, no, turning no, no, out. Not his reaction, yeah. just with the story. <laughs> With the end result of the story, you just answer. I apologize for bringing up the all. No, no, don't apologize. Are you happy with how the end result? Of no, story? definitely okay. not. I'm not happy how it's ending right now. I did not mean it to turn into whatever happened. No, are you happy with it as a product, like as an, a piece of art? When you're watching a podcast like JRE, the whole thing comes off natural and effortless. But behind the scenes, Joe was particular about guiding the conversations, because he knew how crucial they were to the success of the show, and clearly believed in his potential to get it where it is now, if he could just nail that aspect. Yeah. Like sometimes someone will interrupt a really good story and take a sidetrack where they talk about themselves, like they have an opportunity to talk about themselves, but you're right. in the middle of a story. Oh, Brian. And you've done this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it just becomes a real problem. Over its lifespan, the Joe Rogan experience has been rife with iconic moments. One of the most viewed episodes was in 2018, when Elon Musk came on as a guest. Unfortunately, when he took a hit of that stinky green, he made Tesla stock take a hit of 9% in the process. In lighting up that devil's lettuce, he also lit up literally billions of dollars in flames. Not only that, but because SpaceX is a government contractor, and the substance in question is still illegal at the federal level, the feds were randomly drug testing him and his employees for the next year. It just goes to show how influential JRE is, and how much havoc you can wreak by just giving in to Joe's charismatic coaxing about how miraculous it is, which he spends a concern conservative 50% of the podcast doing. Okay, that's an exaggeration. He spends 50% talking about monkeys. I went to San Diego Zoo. That line was pissing on everybody. Dude. If chimps were everywhere and they had full freedom, the way people do, we'd have a fucking serious problem. It would be chaos. You wouldn't be able to leave your house. If there was as many chimps as there were oh, people, you would never be able to get to your car. They would oh, mug you every chance you. they got. They would rip your fucking feet off oh. and, and fuck your ass. If you don't think chimps will steal babies and eat them, you haven't been paying attention to the literature. Crazy 800 pounds silverback is bursting through with the people? tree. A big part of the podcast revenue are its sponsors, and JRE's first sponsor was, well, on brand for Rogan at the time. It was the Fleshlight. Nowadays, Joe profits off of selling supplements, as he owns shares in Onnit Labs, which produces nootropic products such as Alpha Brain. He regularly promotes the supplement on the show, no doubt earning a pretty penny in the process. And speaking of earnings, you've probably at least heard of the exclusivity deal with Spotify that launched his already hulking net worth into the stratosphere. But you may be surprised to find out that the first number the media got a hold of for how much the deal was worth, 100 million, was actually less than half of its true value. With his earnings from acting, comedy, the UFC, the podcast, and now this deal, you gotta wonder just how loaded the guy really is. In 2020, we got a better idea when he moved to Austin, Texas, into a home worth a staggering $14 million. But hey, if he's dodging California's taxes, he might just be saving money. In February 2023, in a surprising turn of events, Rogan's now 81-year-old father would come forward claiming Joe's been lying about him being abusive. His other family helped him release a series of TikToks trying to capture Joe's attention, threatening to unleash some kind of mystery evidence against Rogan if he doesn't comply with their demands. And what is it exactly they want? They just want Joe to sit down and have a private conversation with his dad, with no cameras as they say, though I'm not sure why there would be any cameras or what is even supposed to come of this conversation. If you're wondering why I have a skeptic tone towards these people right out of the gates, I think you'll understand once you watch the videos. While I have to maintain that everything on both sides is alleged, for legal reasons, anyone who's had to deal with insane family members will enjoy these clips. Joseph incessantly slams the table, points at the camera, and talks about Rogan's lack of balls as he claims that family is everything, while his daughter implies that familial matters should stay secret, threatening Joe with quote-unquote Pandora's box. And her half-brother talks about Joe Sr. being a real New Jersey cop, so of course he could never do anything wrong while doing incessant finger motions. It's just a totally unhinged video on the whole, which I think I need to share with you guys. Lied about me. Your father. If you lied about your father, what do you, what do you, give, you give up the world? I'm tired of it, Joe. I just had enough. If you can't talk to me face to face, you're a punk ass. That's all you are. You got all the money, everything, but you know what you don't have? You don't have no heart, and I'm gonna tell you something else you don't have. 
You ain't got two balls. I love when I see the comments. They just want the money. They want the money bag. Mm -hmm. I have a box, Pandora's box. And if I open it, Joe, things would get really ugly. But see, we don't roll that way. I, us psychopaths from New Jersey, we don't roll that way. Italian psychopaths. Italian psychopaths. Whether or not you Italian. like it or Why, not. You're part, you're Italian, He's Joe. three quarters Italian, whether or not he likes it or I not. I don't know, but you better look in the I mirror real quick. Yeah. Joe Sr.'s claim is that Joe's mom told him lies because she was vindictive after the divorce, but Rogan originally claimed to have witnessed the abuse firsthand. It's a strange state of affairs, and while Rogan is probably aware of it at this point, he has yet to respond. Joe Rogan's newest endeavor is a comedy club called Mothership Comedy, as his love for stand-up still has yet to fade. Seeing as himself and his friends have faced controversy after controversy, with Joe especially coming under fire these past couple of years, he wanted to create an establishment he couldn't be kicked out of. Because, well, he owns the thing. Following this, various other comedians have moved to Austin, and it's overall an exciting time for the stand-up scene. Whatever your personal opinions are about Joe Rogan, we can all agree that it's captivating to watch him bounce between a myriad of different occupations in a way that almost looks haphazard from the outside, and still end up on top of it after it all. You can't help but empathize when someone talks about being bullied and feeling like a loser, only to conquer it all and make stupid amounts of money doing so. And well, it's nice for me to tell a story that isn't all bad for once. I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.